the Saab S39 Gripen is unique in many aspects. It was never supposed to be built. It is the smallest and the lightest of modern Delta canards. It is also the simplest and the cheapest of all of them. And it can be purchased in flat packs. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we are discussing are very hard to find anywhere else on YouTube. The sub vegan that was the backbone of the Swedish Air Force in the 70s had a dark side. At some point, it absorbed 40% of the Swedish military balance, and it was deemed to be, well, simply too expensive. In fact, the Riksdag, Swedish parliament, voted a bill that there was not going to be another entirely Swedish combat aircraft. So, in 1978, when the Swedish Air Force started examining the possibility of a successor, politicians went mad. First, it was asked that the plane had to have a clearly defensive focus and it had to be managed within the Swedish system, made of very few professional forces and small bases dispersed in the country. Second, politics realized the implication of buying a foreign plane that was losing a large portion of the 20,000 highly specialized jobs in the military aerospace industry. So, the Defense Committee submitted three alternatives to the Riksdag. A new Swedish plane, a foreign plane built in Sweden, suggesting the F-16 or the F-18, or the direct purchase of a foreign plane. To further complicate the situation, the Swedish Air Force was considering uh, the idea uh, of adopting different planes for different missions, rather than a single multi-role platform. And when Saab in 1980 presented a proposal for the Gripen, which was a multi-role modern platform, the Air Force was against it. At this point, the future of the program was in jeopardy and the total cancellation was a concrete possibility. A tough political battle developed, but at the end, in 1982, the parliament decided to develop a Swedish multi-role aircraft with just 176 yes and 167 no. The hemorrhaging of foreign currency reserves required to buy an American fighter and the impact on Swedish jobs tilted the scale in favor of a Swedish solution. The Gripen is the smallest and the lightest of the modern Delta Knarts. It is the simplest to operate and the cheapest per flight hour. It is estimated to cost one half of the F-16's cost per flight hour. This is a direct consequence of the particular requirements of the Swedish Air Force and the Swedish government. Having a single engine plane helps containing the costs, but it limits the size and weight of the plane itself because the heavier the plane, the worse is the dynamic performance and nobody wants to go below certain thresholds. And a small plane also is simpler to operate from the dispersed runaways that are integral to the Swedish air defense system. In Sweden, actually, it is given for granted that the air bases will be attacked. So, single planes are supposed to operate from modified motorway sections uh, disseminated all around the Swedish territory. The attacking force needs to pick them one by one to neutralize the Swedish air force. And to make this plan work, it is necessary that the aircraft would require only a skeletal maintenance. While deployed on dispersal sites, a single aircraft can be taken care by a team of one NCO and just four recruits. The turnaround time is between 10 and 15 minutes, and potentially many dozens of missions can be flown before there is any need of any maintenance that can't be executed on the field. And even in this case, the Swedish prefer having itinerant workshops rather than concentrating the planes in an airbase again. A quick description of the aircraft itself is made difficult by the fact that, despite the relatively low numbers produced so far, meaning less than 300, 
The Gripen has been developed in numerous versions and the double seat versions are not simply trainer planes but they are designed for specific combat missions. Actually double seaters are expected to operate in command and control roles or in uh, electronic warfare missions. Also, the current E and F versions have been radically improved and basically they just look similar from the outside to the previous ones while being almost a new plane. So the empty weight is in the region of 7000 kilos for versions from A to D and around 8000 kilos for the E and F versions. The maximum takeoff weights are for the AB about 12 tons for CD about 14 tons and for EF about 16.5 tons. This speaks volumes of the capability of the design to accept improvements and to grow in weight without excessive penalization. However, despite the increase, even the EF version is about 20% lighter than the Eurofighter and the Rafale. And if you look at the Gripen while it is parked on the flight line, it looks small if compared with the other modern planes. It is less than 15 meters in length and it is 8.5 meters in wingspan and Rafale and Typhoon are about a meter longer, but their wingspan is around 11 meters and they are one meter taller than the Gripen. One of the consequences of being small is the relatively shorter range if compared to the major competitors, uh, which is something that has been partially corrected in the latest EF version. Versions A to D use the Volvo RN12 engine, which is a derivation from the American General Electric 404 with 54 kN thrust. EF versions use the General Electric 4104, a variant of the engine of the Super Hornet with a thrust of 58 kN. It is not to be excluded that Volvo will produce an indigenous engine in the same class at some point in the future. The thrust to weight ratio is worse than the other modern European Delta Knarts, but we will see that this is not as penalizing as it may seem. The aerodynamic configuration is Delta Canard because in conjunction with fly-by-wire and relaxed stability, this configuration features a lower drag and a better maneuverability than the classic configuration with the tail. If you are interested, there is an entire playlist explaining why it is so. The Gripen, though, brought this one step forward. If you look at the back of the Gripen's fuselage, from above but most notably from the side, you might notice that it is tapered to hug the engine nozzle. This may seem trivial, but the tail cone is an essential component to reduce the overall drag of a plane. Civilian or transport planes often have rather elongated tail cones, not only to avoid tail strikes, but also to reduce the fuselage drag. It is possible to understand intuitively why it is so. The air separates when it encounters the fuselage in a similar way as it does with the wings. It flows along the side of the plane at a higher speed than the free flow, only to reunite at the tail of the fuselage. Since the speed is higher than the free flow, the static pressure on the fuselage side is lower than the free flow pressure. If the fuselage terminates abruptly with the engine nozzle, the air will be just sucked away by the engine exhaust, reducing even more the pressure, and there is nothing but hot gas to exert the pressure against. But if the fuselage is tapered toward the nozzle, the flow gradually slows down and increases in pressure, and part of that pressure is directed forward. This is a force against the drag that is usually accounted as a reduced drag. In the case of the Gripen, we know very unofficially that the accurate design of the tail section of the fuselage has reduced the fuselage, just the fuselage drag, by almost 15% if compared with a stride design like it was on the Vigan. If you consider that the overall aerodynamic design is rather clean, it is easy to believe that the low drag can help compensate the low thrust to weight ratio when it comes to acceleration and top speed. 
in fact, and quite surprisingly, in a complete air to air configuration with one external drop tank, the plane can supercruise at Mach 1.1. The low wing load also gives the plane some excellent roll rate, contributing to a performance more than acceptable in a modern environment. We have reports of Eurofighter pilots stating that in an energy based combat, the Gripen is a relatively easy prey. But the small fighter that comes from the cold has other resources that we haven't talked about yet. We are going to open this flat pack in the next video. In the late January of 2013, a flight of seven Saab Gripen CD landed at Nellis Air Force Base in the United States in the middle of the desert. One may wonder what a bunch of Swedes in small fighter jets were doing in the middle of the desert. Well, very simple, they were going to the red flag. Red flag is probably the best training exercise for a military pilot in the world. By the use of a sophisticated electronic simulation equipment, the air missions over a vast expanse of American desert are as close as it gets to a real war. The Swedish Air Force and the Gripen had already been at the red flag a few times, the first time in 2006, with very good results. But this time was different. This time, the Gripens were on the red team. At Red Flag, the simulated hostilities are between two parties, the blue and the red team. Uh, the blue team is normally intended to simulate a NATO force operating against an opponent, which is a mix of other NATO forces and the professional aggressors, uh, the red team. While the blue team operates with all the high value assets that the NATO is planning to deploy, like OWACs, electronic warfare, support planes, ground control coordination, and so on, the red team has much more limited support. The AWACS or the ground control just send you in the direction of the blue force and good luck. Many were curious to see how the Gripen would have performed in such a difficult role. It is not impossible to imagine that many had thought that the small fighter was going to be an easy prey, but oh boy. They were very, very, very wrong. The Grippers networked their system with some planes acting as OAXs. OAXs? Is that the word? They gained the necessary situation awareness and used their electronic ship to avoid the air defenses and get within the range of the enemy planes. The first day, they scored 10 kills, including Typhoons and F 16 Block 50. Plus. During the whole red flag, they never lost an aerial encounter, they never failed the mission, they never delayed the mission for bad weather or technical problems. At the end of the exercise, the only fighter with a score better than the Gripen was the mighty F-22, and even that only just. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here are very difficult to find anywhere else on YouTube. It is always difficult to have accurate reports on training exercises. What you have to work with often are fragments of information and not always very reliable. While our initial story may not be 100% accurate, it actually reflects the tone of all the information I was capable of unhurting, including some quite old paper. After some research, it was clear that there were no news of the Gripen doing bad in an exercise. The plane was used in Libya as a reconnaissance asset, but it never saw combat, so all we have are these exercises. There are the Typhoon pilots who say that if the Gripen is using its ECM for real, it can get scarily close before being detected. 
And then there is that time when three Swedish Gripens went against five Norwegian F-16s and the result after three rounds was 5-0-5-0-5-1 for the Gripens. Or that episode when in an exercise in Sweden a Gripen acting as an aggressor surprised three F-15, shooting down two and scaring away the, the third. Or the reports from the Royal Thai Air Force that during an exercise against Chinese J-11 and Sukhoi-27 achieved a 4-0 kill ratio. So there should be a reason for all this good press. Every single seat Gripen is armed with a 27mm Mauser BK-27 cannon, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. Saab is clear that the Gripen is sold with the ability to integrate every weapon the customer may desire, and the plane is designed to make the process the easiest possible. The hard points have been designed since the beginning to be compatible with NATO standard, but more importantly, the software is designed to be modular. The flight control software runs in an isolated kernel, while any other piece of software is actually a separate application that can be installed and run autonomously. So while the physical integration still needs to be certified and to work on the plane, the software controlling the weapon is just a separate executable installed on the modular computers and it doesn't require to retest and recertify the rest of the software when installed. And Saab is using this architecture to continuously deliver improvements to Gripen's customers. So for the air-to-air -air role, the plane is certified for Sidewinder, Amram, Skyflash, Iris T, Darter, and notably the Meteor, which gives the plane a remarkably large kill zone. If you are interested, there is an entire video dedicated to this very peculiar weapon. For the air-to-ground missions, we have tactical missiles like the RB-75, which is actually a copy of the Maverick. We have long-range cruise missiles like the Taurus. We have Paveway, laser-guided bombs, G GBU-39, small diameter bombs, uh, JDAMs, RBS-15, anti-ship missiles, and anything else you may think of. The maximum payload for the EF version is around 6 tons. The Gripen has also been integrated with various pods for reconnaissance or target designation, like for example the Israeli Lightning, which is quite common, but also many others. While the panoply is remarkably large and open to implementation, there are other areas where the Gripen is shining, and shining very, very brightly. The Gripen has been built around its suite of sensor and electronic warfare. This was a choice dictated by the consideration that physical stealth effectiveness is slowly being eroded with time by new defensive countermeasures and tactics. Stealth based on geometry and radar absorbing materials is hard to upgrade in any way because it is built into the aircraft structure. Relying on sensor and electronic warfare, on the contrary, allows for a continuous improvement of software and hardware. And grip and sensor, in fact, have evolved massively from the version A to version E. The main sensor in version E is the Raven ES5 radar produced by the Italian Galileo in Scotland. At the moment of filming, it is considered to be one of the best AESA radar in the world, even if the performances have never been declared, uh, there are two elements that set it apart from the competition. The about 1000 emitter receiver modules use gallium nitride, which is reported to improve the efficiency and the sensitivity of the antenna by a definitely non-negligible amount. As usual, the actual numbers are a close-guarded secret. The second element is the so-called repositioner, which is a true stroke of genius from an engineering point of view. AESA radars usually have a flat fixed antenna positioned within the radoom and perpendicular to the plane axis. AESA radars steer their beam electronically, switching on and off the antenna modules at high speed, allowing for much more sophisticated search, track and map techniques than a conventional mechanical antenna. One advantage is that in this way the complex and expensive gimbal mount required to 
point the antenna in a specific direction is just removed, improving cost and reliability. The Raven ES5 has the antenna mounted at an angle with the axis and the antenna rotates around the axis. The great advantage of this solution is that the radar can look backwards. A modern easy radar can achieve beam deflection from 60 to 80 degrees on each side. The antenna inclination angle adds to the deflection uh, and the beam can be actually pointed backwards. The Raven ES5 declares a deflection of 110 degrees, but considering the geometry of the radar, I would expect to be more. The advantage of this is that the plane can still track a target while moving away from it or just running circles around it without using additional antennas positioned elsewhere on the airframe like in the Sukhoi 57. If tracking can be maintained, then the weapons can be guided to attack the target by data links or semi-active homing. So to be totally clear, the Gripen can attack a target there. There are very few radars in service or in development that use this configuration and there is a sort of philosophical debate if reintroducing a moving part is worth it, but still I believe it is an outstanding solution. Quite curiously, the brochure that can be downloaded from the Galileo website says that the radar can track one target, and this is something that I don't believe for a second, uh, since even the most lightweight and simplified modern radar can track multiple targets. The other main sensor is the Skyward G infrared search and track. Once again, built by Galileo in Erviano, near Milan, in Italy. Some reliable press sources say that it can be considered the most advanced infrared search and track currently available on the market. And, well, as usual, it is difficult to confirm these press allegations, but surely it is a modern product that includes all the features that can be found in a modern infrared search and track. It uses dual band sensors and optical zooms, and it claims to be able to track up to 200 targets at the same time. If it's true, it is outstanding. Like your home theater amplifier, the infrared search and track has a digital video exit, an analog video exit, and a network exit. Unlike your home theater amplifier, it doesn't use commercial standards. The digital video standard is the recent uh, Arink 818. The analog video standard is the Stanag 3350, a well-known RGB-based format that has allowed the exchange of videos among different platforms since the 90s, that is way, way behind <laughs> the civilian counterparts in terms of pixel resolution. The network connection is based on the venerable MIL STD 1553, which is the Ethernet of military equipment. Even if more modern standards do exist, like for example the fiber optic bus used by the Eurofighter Typhoon. It is through the MIL STD 1553 network that the track information from the radar and the infrastructure and track flow to the grip and modular computers. The information is analyzed, tracks are deduplicated, and they are presented in a unified picture to the pilot who in turn can use them to generate the fire solutions for the weapon. While this feature was present on the Gripen A, it was only the Gripen C that could achieve proper data fusion rather than simple uh, co-presentation. In the Gripen EF, the feature has obviously been refined and on the Brazilian variant, the characteristic three multifunction displays have been replaced with a single panoramic wide-angle screen similar to what is installed on the F-35 that could make the happiness of every video game player. Data can be shared with other platforms by Link16, but the Gripen has also its own stealth proprietary link. Actually, Sweden was one of the nations that pioneered the integration of data link into planes and ground stations, and the Subdraken in the early 60s had some primitive forms of data link that kept evolving with the Vigen into the modern implementation on the Gripen. The electronic warfare suite is considered to be the grip and strong point and the secret sauce that makes the plane so lethal despite the other limitation. It may seem strange that a country like Sweden could produce uh, an outstanding electronic warfare suite, but Saab and Ericsson have a long tradition, but they always kept a low profile. 
and they have been so good at keeping a low profile that we really know very very little about the electronic warfare shit. We have the usual diagrams showing the hardware, uh, the location of the sensor, of the antennas and the countermeasures. We know that a Tau decoy is available. We know that the electronic warfare fuses its data with the other sensors. We don't know for sure if the plane can provide a fully passive fire solution to the missiles, uh, but we can safely infer that this is the case. But what matters the most, we don't know any detail about the jamming capabilities. What we know is that the Typhoon pilots know that the Gripen is impossible to be seen till when it's too late. Hello clever people, the big videos about the Gripen have been very successful and someone actually asked me if there was going to be a part 3. Well, no, unfortunately there is no part 3 and in a couple of weeks time we're going to move on to newer and even better things. However, since there is so much interest around the Gripen, I thought that you might like a short companion video while the Q&A and the new block of videos is getting prepared. Having had access to Saab's media library, there is some material available that was not used in the big videos, but I think you might still enjoy it. So without further ado, let's listen what pilots have to say about the Gripen. Uh, the Gripen is a great aircraft for the pilot because the interaction between the uh, pilot and the aircraft is very natural and uh, you can, when you fly the Gripen you can feel that you have uh, power and agility at your fingertips and whatever you think of the airplane will execute for you. When flying an aircraft uh, as high tech and as highly integrated as the Gripen you have a level of situational awareness uh, where you know that you have information uh, enough to break the opponent's uh, decision loop. If the opponent flies a more traditional aircraft, uh, you know that he might have a radar and he might be looking at that radar screen, but that's the only sensor you'd be looking at at, at that time. In the Gripen you have all the sensors heavily integrated and your situation awareness will make you win. When using the Gripen in combat you can make a uh, a really good work allocation between you as a pilot and the aircraft uh, to be able to work different roles at the same time. This gentleman was also the man who piloted the Gripen E in its maiden flight. It was uh, it was great. Uh, the uh, well, it's it, it's sort of magical, uh, hard to describe. Uh, just the the feeling taxing out and all right now we're real doing it. We have been taxing out before on the ground trials, but now it was to actually take off uh, and uh, well holding the brakes hearing chase call brakes release and letting go of the brakes and accelerate to know that we're not gonna pull back on the throttle we're not gonna push on the brakes we're gonna take off and uh, during that rotation just a feeling of, of getting airborne and, and actually looking outside and just to confirm that we are flying uh, we did it was uh, undescribable magic So I hope you have enjoyed this short video and if you did, I'm sure you will like the videos appearing on the screen now as well. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. If you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching and goodbye.